Hello everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Unlocking the Power of the Infant Brain, presented by Dr. Takal Hinch. I'm Julianne Chayat of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's presentation. We are excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located on the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you're having trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located on the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Takal Hinch. Dr. Hinch holds a joint faculty appointment in neurology at Harvard Medical School at Boston's Children's Hospital and in the Molecular and Cellular Biology at Harvard University Center for Brain Science. He received his PhD from the University of California, San Francisco, and helped launch the Riken Brain Institute, Science Institute in Japan, where he continues to serve as a special advisor. Dr. Hench has received the Society for Neuroscience Young Investigators Award in both the US in 2005 and in Japan in 2001, the Sukahara Prize. He also received a National Institute of Health Directors Pioneer Award in 2007. He serves on the editorial board of several peer-reviewed journals, including Journal of Neuroscience, Journal of Neurodevelopmental Disorders, Neurodevelopment, Neuroscience Research, Frontiers in Neural Circuits, and Neuron. Dr. Hench's research involves the study of critical periods of brain development. By applying cellular and molecular biology techniques to neural systems, his lab has identified pivotal inhibitory circuits that orchestrate structural and functional rewiring of connections in response to early sensory experience. His work affects not only the basic understanding of brain development, but also the therapeutic approaches to devastating cognitive disorders later in life. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hench. Thank you, Julianne. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks to all of you for joining online. We're interested in how the brain is shaped by early life experiences. And this is a topic that's been of great interest to humans throughout history. Probably you've had experiences in your own life which are consistent with the idea that what we learn in childhood has a very potent effect on our behavior throughout life. Aristotle put it, the habits we form from childhood make no small difference, but rather they make all the difference. And if this is true, it's especially important as parents or educators or clinicians to wonder what are the right kinds of environment and stimuli for our children. Or as Calvin put it here, what assurance does he have that his parents aren't screwing him up? These are windows of opportunity opportunity for shaping the languages we speak, the motor skills we have, our emotional outlook on life, all sorts of positive behavioral outcomes come to mind. But the most dramatic uh, evidence that these are critical periods for brain development is the intriguing overlap of the emergence of many mental illnesses or disorders early in life. Here, a slide from a science review in 2014 by uh, Lee et al maps the emergence of a variety of uh, common mental illnesses that are emerging during the teen, teenage, or younger years, including even earlier in childhood, such as autism. Our interest is to understand how these windows of brain development or vulnerability come about through a biological process known as critical periods. These are windows of experience that shape our brain function as a classic interaction between the genes which lay out the circuitry in our brain in utero and form uh, vir virtually identical pathways early in life, but are then dramatically shaped to our unique environments. 
And that's why ultimately each one of us becomes a unique individual speaking unique languages with unique outlook on life. One of the important aspects of critical periods is that there isn't just one of them. There are multiple such windows throughout our brain's development. And so roughly, we think of a hierarchy of critical periods where first primary sensory areas are sculpted by experience, which forms the foundation for higher order brain functions like language or motor skills and ultimately higher cognitive functions like planning and decision making. In the laboratory, what we're interested in is to understand the biological basis for these windows. In other words, what turns them on when they happen, what determines their duration, and what ultimately might turn them off or uh, limit brain plasticity. In order to study this in the laboratory, many people have turned to animal models or experimental systems where it's possible to manipulate the input and then go straight to the part of the brain which is responsible for processing that information. Perhaps the best known model of critical period brain development is the visual system. Vision enters through the eye and stimulates the back of the brain in a region known as the visual cortex. This system is popular for a variety of reasons. First of all, it's known to develop postnatally. It receives input from two sources only, the right eye and the left eye. And thanks to the work of Hubel and Liesel and many other uh, scientists since, we know a fair bit about the visual pathways. In other words, visual signals arrive through the eye and make a synapse in the deep thalamic nuclei, the lateral geniculate nucleus, and then converge onto individual neurons in the primary visual cortex, where a competition ensues early in life between the right eye and left eye for a territory in the visual cortex. The third reason this system is popular is we know its function, namely to see. And the development of visual acuity is something which can be tracked from mouse to human and is remarkably sensitive to early life visual abnormalities. So for example, some of you may have or know someone who has a lazy eye where one of the two eyes is not viewing the same scene as the other eye, either due to a strabismus or a deviation of the eye muscles or an occlusion, say a cataract um, early in life. If this situation in the two eyes is not corrected before the age of eight, a rapid plastic process in the visual cortex is disconnecting those inputs which are less salient to the animal or the human. And as a result, a condition known as amblyopia arises, which is the enduring loss of visual acuity through an eye that's uh, deviant or occluded, even though there's no physical damage to the eye. This process is something that can be studied and has great clinical significance since amblyopia affects about three to 5% of the human population. The reason that this, treat, this condition becomes harder and harder to treat after the age of eight to 10 in, in people is that there is an ever declining Entwicklungspotenz or plasticity in this visual cortex. This system can be studied in other forward viewing mammals like the cat or monkey. And as mentioned, uh, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel did pioneering work in the 60s and 70s recording directly from the primary visual cortex of kittens to identify what are the features of the visual stimulus which best activate these neurons. When they patched one eye of a kitten or a monkey and then injected a tracer into one eye to see which parts of the visual cortex were innervated by this input, they noticed a dramatic re-sculpting of circuitry. So on the left here, you see a nicely uh, innervated, equally balanced left eye and right eye combination of input, white and black stripes alternating, known as ocular dominance columns, in the thalamic input to the visual cortex. Below is the brain of an animal in which one eye had been occluded. Again, no damage was done to the retina, simply an imbalance of visual experience was created. And as a result, you see that the open eye is now dominating the visual cortex. 
And it's no wonder then that this situation becomes harder and harder to reverse as the animal becomes older, since there's very little territory remaining that serves the deprived eye. This work, of course, won them the Nobel Prize in 1981. And since it has been a great interest to figure out the mechanisms underlying why this plastic process happens and when it happens. So to give you a quick summary of today's talk, a large uh, push in this field has come from the use of mouse models of the visual system. Now you might think this is funny because mice work or live in the dark and they typically don't use their visual system so much, relying more on smell or whisking. But thanks to the advent of gene targeting technologies, we can manipulate factors thought to be important in this process and see what effect they have. To give you the punchline at the outset, in this talk I'll give you evidence for three things. First, we now have an understanding of what turns on these critical periods, and remarkably it seems to reflect the development or maturation of inhibitory circuits in the brain. And in fact, the work is proceeded to pinpoint a particular type of inhibitory neuron called the parvalbumin cell, which I will tell you much more about in the talk. On the flip side, these critical periods seem to close or circuits become more stable as a result of the emergence of other factors, which I will group together as uh, molecular breaks, molecules whose expression actively counteracts any attempt at rewiring, in other words, stabilizing the circuitry. And the third point is that if these two biological triggers and breaks are true throughout the brain, the critical period itself might be plastic. In other words, the time window may shift depending on the development of these triggers and breaks. And this has enormous implications for therapies and strategies for recovery from brain injury or correcting um, neurodevelopmental trajectories which may be uh, going awry. So first of all, we need to be sure that the mouse visual system is useful for studying these phenomena. And in fact, you can show this very nicely by recording the activity of the visual cortex directly with an electrode placed over or inside the primary visual cortex of an animal viewing a screen. On the screen, you can present low or high spatial frequency grading patterns and at low frequency evoke a very nice visually evoked potential, which gradually becomes smaller as the stimulus gets ever finer. And so, as advertised, mice are pretty bad at vision. Their baseline visual acuity is around 0.5 cycles per degree, which is much less than uh, highly visual creatures such as ourselves, who can see on the order of tens of cycles per degree. Nevertheless, looking at this, you can perform this monocular deprivation experiment where one eye is covered with, in this case, a yellow patch for a few days at various times after birth. Doing this experiment, you find that the visual acuity of a mouse, as poor as it is, becomes worse if the patching happens only during a particular critical period, around 20 to 40 days after birth. And this is an enduring amblyopic type effect because these recordings are in fact made in adult animals long after the patch has been removed. Instead, a similar duration of deprivation in animals older than say postnatal day 60 produces no such change in vision. And as a result, we have a critical period for measuring visual acuity in mouse primary visual cortex. Over the years, a number of studies have identified the physical structural changes which accompany this patching of one eye in a mouse. And a number of molecules have been implicated in this rewiring process. And so initially, after just a few days of deprivation, there's a biochemical buildup represented in blue in the top row here of proteolytic factors like tissue type plasminogen activator or TPA. This molecule is a kind of molecular scissors known to have as its target cell adhesion molecules like NCAM and telencephalin, molecules which can be cleaved and dislocate or uh, disconnect these dendritic spines which are receiving those thalamic axonal inputs, for example, onto them. 
As a result, after two days of patching an eye, not only does this biochemistry change, but also these dendritic spines start to wiggle or twitch, as shown by two-photon microscopy in the living mouse brain. But two days of deprivation is not yet enough to produce a change in vision. It takes a few more days, and at that point, you see that the total number of spines has actually been pruned or reduced in number, and the axons serving the deprived eye start to shrink or retract. Ultimately, these proteases drop back down to baseline levels, the blue haze disappears, and this allows for the growth of new spines and the sprouting of axons, such as the white open eye axons in the previous slide. This highly orchestrated series of events, initial weakening of the deprived eye input, followed by strengthening of the open eye connections, happens readily during this critical period, but not in adult animals. And so the focus of this talk is to identify what might be the triggers that initiate this kind of biochemical cascade and what might be the breaks which turn this off or make it harder to change later in life. These spines live on excitatory pyramidal cells. These are the majority of neuron found in the cerebral cortex and are studded with those dendritic spines. And for decades, researchers have focused on excitatory plasticity mechanisms on these neurons, which are readily encountered by an electrode, for example, passed into the brain. Interestingly, evidence over the past 15 years has suggested that it's the surrounding inhibitory neurons, the neurons which secrete GABA, which actually determine when all of this happens. Inhibitory neurons have fascinated neuroscientists for over a century. Since the time of Cajal, they've been appreciated as very rich in their morphology and diverse in their connectivity. And so they've garnered uh, beautiful names like the double bouquet cell, which spans the cortical layers from the top to the bottom, la layer one to layer six. Or basket cells, which make the classic lateral inhibitory type connections, forming a basket type synapse around the cell body of its targets or chandelier cells, long stringy cells, and so on. They all secrete GABA, but they target very specific parts of the target neuron. Evidence has been accumulating, which I'll show you now, that one particular subtype of these neurons, the basket type neuron, may be particularly important for triggering these critical periods. For one thing, you can knock down or disrupt the maturation of inhibitory cells, and this window of plasticity will shift later in age. For example, you can raise mice in total darkness, and we know that this will delay the critical period to ages when the animal is considered technically an adult. Conversely, you can fool the system by prematurely enhancing inhibition with a drug like a benzodiazepine, diazepam, just after the eyes open, which is around postnatal day 12 in mice, when patching of an eye typically has no effect yet on visual acuity. Enhancing inhibition prematurely shifts the critical period to the left. And so, in fact, playing with the GABAergic system gives us bidirectional control over the timing when this window happens. Now, it's very interesting to consider that inhibition is needed for brain plasticity to occur. In order to explain this, we need a number of ideas, and I'll present a few of them. First of all, the maturation of inhibition may sharpen the neural code. So in the top row, you see a cartoon representing the immature condition, where inhibition is weak and there's quite a bit of spontaneous activity. As a result, the neuron on the right will be confused or have difficulty to enact typical spike timing dependent plasticity rules in order to strengthen or weaken connectivity. But as inhibition matures, the noise gets cleaned up and the evoked responses based on visual stimuli coming in through the eye will be quantized into little packets. And this allows traditional excitatory synaptic plasticity rules both in a computational model as well as in recordings from in vivo animals to allow plasticity to proceed. A second possibility is that these inhibitory neurons might also be plastic themselves. 
because they are so sparse, only representing 20% of the neurons in the cortex and subdivided into many classes, it's been difficult to test which inhibitory neurons might respond in a plastic or non-plastic manner. These basket-type neurons have a characteristic signature which does make it possible to identify them on occasion. And in our own work published in 2009, or in this work studied in the CAT by Marcos Frank's group, we did just that. These fast spiking inhibitory neurons can be identified on the basis of their thin action potentials and the ability to fire at high rates. And if you patch one eye for just a few hours in the case of the cat or a few days in the case of mice, you see that the first cells to change their responsiveness are not the excitatory pyramidal neurons, but in fact, these fast spiking neurons. And interestingly, as shown here in this figure, the fast spiking neurons will shift from a non-biased, preferring neither eye situation to a biased situation where they actually prefer the closed eye more. And then eventually with longer deprivation, they shift in favor of the open eye. Only at that point do you see the excitatory neurons, the principal neurons, finally showing any kind of plastic change. This is just based on spiking patterns. Nowadays, you can tag inhibitory cells with a fluorescent protein, as Josh Trachtenberg's lab has done here, and then patch onto these cells by their fluorescent color. And in fact, they have shown that these parvalbumin positive cells, the basket cells, are in fact the first to respond to monocular deprivation with a drop in firing rate. Third evidence that these inhibitory neurons are perhaps specifically acting on uh, brain plasticity is an overwhelming amount of genetic and pharmacological evidence that these critical periods will shift in time, as I mentioned before, by acting on genes or molecules that promote the development of these inhibitory neurons. So in fact, now in our mouse facility, we might find animals whose critical periods have been shifted earlier because of a precocious maturation of inhibition, for example, by the overexpression of a neurotrophic factor like BDNF, or delayed because of the lack of factors which cause these cells to develop more slowly. Other manipulations, such as in the middle row, have been found to extend the duration or narrow the duration of these critical periods. And third, conditions exist where the critical period might never open, such as the disruption of a GABA synthesizing enzyme, GAD65, or open but never close. And this leads us at the end of the talk to the concept of molecular breaks. Let me just illustrate one series of experiments done recently how we might ask questions about critical period timing. This revolves around the clock gene. So you might ask yourself, are critical periods determined by a clock since they happen at particular times in development? And in fact, the clock system is very well studied in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which generates circadian rhythmicity in our brain. The clock rhythm is set by a transcriptional feedback loop when two transcription factors, clock and BMAL, drive the expression of circadian genes, and these genes then feed back to inhibit this transcription in a roughly 24-hour cycle, which gives us circadian rhythmicity. But if you step out from the suprachiasmatic nucleus and zoom out to the rest of the body and brain, it's quite clear that clock genes are expressed everywhere. And in fact, it's increasingly being appreciated that different parts of the body, in fact, may have their own circadian rhythmicity. We wondered here whether these clock genes have any role in critical period timing. If you take the mouse visual cortex in adult animals and you look at gene expression at four hour intervals over the course of 24 hour day, you find that sure enough, these clock genes show circadian rhythmicity. Interestingly though, early in development, say for example, before the eyes open, these rhythms don't exist. And in fact, they emerge gradually just after eye opening in correlation with the onset timing of this visual critical period. And so if you knock out the clock gene, what happens to critical period timing? We can assay these animals using the visual acuity assay I mentioned earlier, and we find that 
Unlike wild-type mice, which respond to four days of monocular deprivation, or MD, at postnatal day 25 by a loss of acuity, the clock knockout mice don't respond. They're not plastic at this typical age. But if you let them grow up to older ages, postnatal day 60, they are suddenly plastic. And this suggests that their critical period has been delayed. As I mentioned in my summary diagram earlier, this is a situation we're now quite familiar with. A delayed critical period suggests that inhibition has not yet matured. To prove this, we can try to rescue these animals. If we, in fact, inject the animals with a benzodiazepine drug during this early expected critical period, lo and behold, plasticity emerges. Or if we simulate a critical period by enhancing inhibition for several days during the typical age, their older plasticity disappears as if the critical period were closed. In order to determine which circuits might be mediating this effect, we looked at co-localization of clock with a variety of inhibitory cell markers. And quite satisfyingly, we find that over 80% of parvalbumin positive basket type uh, neurons express clock. This is higher than any of the other subtypes of inhibitory neuron. And so if we look in panel D at the puncta or synapses formed by these parvalbumin cells, they are visibly decreased in number quantified to the right. And if you patch onto the target neuron, you find that there's a concur concomitant decrease in the frequency of miniature inhibitory synaptic currents. And so in order to determine once and for all whether it's clock expression in these parvalbumin circuits which delays the critical period, we knocked out the clock gene only from parvalbumin cells using conditional gene targeting approaches. And this nicely replicates the total knockout situation. Monocular deprivation in parvalbumin clock knockouts or in green parvalbumin BMAL knockout mice shows diminished plasticity at the critical period age and ectopic plasticity at adult ages, just like the total knockout mouse. To be extra sure, we also knocked out clock from all of the pyramidal neurons, vastly outnumbering the inhibitory cells. But this has no effect on critical period plasticity. So disrupting the clock gene in pyramidal neurons retains a normal plastic response in green, loss of acuity at the typical critical period age. So in summary, this little study has confirmed that there is a, probably a role for clock genes in developmental timing. And in fact, in the absence of clock, in particular from parvalbumin positive basket neurons, the, the critical period onset is delayed. This finding has a number of immediate implications. For one thing, if the maturation of these parvalbumin cells is causing the critical period to happen when it does, you might be able to produce a second critical period by transplanting immature parvalbumin cells into the cortex. This sort of uh, stem cell type approach has been taken by the laboratory of Michael Stryker and Arturo Alvarez Buya several years ago, where they excised the source of inhibitory neurons, the medial ganglionic eminence, from which they normally migrate, and transplanted them into postnatal visual cortex. What they found was that these cells will gradually integrate into the local circuitry and they will produce a second critical period plasticity window. Interestingly though, they observed that the second window only comes about once the transplant has matured to about one month of age, which would be its natural age inside the intact brain when the natural critical period would start. And so a cell autonomous clock mechanism may in fact be at work in this scenario. From the point of view of mental illness, clock genes have been implicated in a variety of conditions and typically interpreted as having their impact on cognitive function because of its effects on circadian rhythmicity. Just like anybody who suffered from jet lag, you know that your brain doesn't function well if the circadian rhythm is disrupted. Our results suggest a second possibility, that a disruption of circadian genes throughout life and development in particular, may have also mistimed critical developmental windows in these patients who carry these uh, polymorphisms. And so you might wonder, to what extent does this generalize? 
Parvalbumin positive basket cells make these nest like basket synapses at different times in different brain regions. This is a drawing in the inset from Ramoni Cajal of a parvalbumin positive, presumptive parvalbumin positive basket cell uh, synaptic meshwork. But from such figures, we have no idea whether it's one cell making multiple contacts or a convergence of multiple cells onto one target. Nowadays, with uh, modern technologies such as Brainbow, an ability to tag individual cells in different fluorescent colors, we can start to answer these uh, connectomic questions and come to some conclusion as to whether it's a convergence or a change in wiring of these circuits that happens across development. For now, I'd like to point out that the time window during which these inhibitory neurons mature is, in fact, staggered. And so we've been talking about the visual cortex here in green, which uh, shows a maturation of these parvalbumin cells just in advance of the critical period around postnatal day 20 to 22. But if you look, look earlier within the same mouse brain, you find that these cells mature even earlier in the primary somatosensory cortex or primary auditory cortex, predicting, if this model is correct, that a critical period should exist at this earlier time in these brain regions. So let's do the experiment. If you move to the auditory cortex, the representation is not of visual input, but of sound. And there's a beautiful tonotopic map, which is displayed across the surface of the auditory cortex. In panel A, you see blood vessels highlighted in gray, and colored dots, which represent the best frequency that activates neurons in those regions. And the frequencies are indicated in the heat map on the right. The panel A recording is taken from an adult animal raised under normal conditions. Panel B is the recording of his brother, who had been exposed to tones of 7 kilohertz, a lime green color in this map, for three days only at around postnatal day 12 to 15, so about 10 days earlier than the visual critical period. And sure enough, this has led to an expansion of the lime green ter territory at the expense of neighboring frequencies. And this sort of competitive expansion of the tonotopic map has very many similarities to the competition between the left and right eye input we've just been talking about. This change in sound frequency maps may in fact underlie something that we're all familiar with in our own human biology, namely that infants acquire the ability to hear and discriminate native speech sounds over non-native speech sounds early in life. In fact, quite a bit of developmental linguistic work has been done mapping out milestones of language development. And in fact, we know that there is a narrowing of perception during the first few months of life when infants born anywhere in the world gradually prune away the ability to hear speech sounds not represented in their native language. This then segues into a second critical period when auditory and visual signals, namely the shape and um, uh, layout of the speaker's face, is matched to the sound that they are producing. And this ripples all the way through the language system to the point where we are able to discriminate native and non-native uh, speech sounds and, and turn it into language. And human imaging studies have shown in the right that the ability to process a native language versus a second language acquired after the age of 11 is generally non-overlapping in particular parts of the language system, whereas they remain overlapping in people who are raised in multilingual environments. Given this knowledge of multiple uh, time windows and critical periods in the language domain, we wondered, uh, in collaboration with Janet Worker's lab at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, whether exposure to a drug which might prematurely enhance inhibition and alter this excitatory inhibitory balance might shift these milestones. And I won't go into the details, but you're welcome to look for this paper in PNAS in 2012, where we found exactly that. Infants exposed through the mother's uh, taking of drugs like SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, led to premature closure of these early windows. And conversely, mothers who didn't take the drug but 
were suffering from depression showed in their infants a delay of their critical period, suggesting that these windows may be movable also in people. If you consider that critical period timing happens for a reason, it might not be surprising then to consider neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism as the consequence of a ripple effect. A small jitter of timing might escalate as it passes from primary sensory areas to ever higher order brain regions and then ultimately manifest as a complex cognitive disorder, which we know as autism. In order to test whether these principles also apply to higher order multisensory areas, which might be responsible for integrating a number of these inputs, we turned our attention to the insular cortex. This part of the human brain has been implicated in a number of mental illnesses and is a very high order brain region involved in a number of processes such as pain perception, language, social brain, the control of urges and emotion regulation, and interoception, the um, response to visceroceptive signals from within the body, which might be perceived as painful. It's called the insular cortex because in the human brain, it's tucked deep within the folds of the brain and is difficult to access. In the case of the lysencephalic mouse brain, however, it's conveniently right on the surface on the lateral side of the brain, just anterior to the auditory cortex we were talking about. We can image this part of the brain, the IC or insular cortex, as um, an area which can be activated by a number of sensory inputs, such as a tone or a tactile stimulus, like an air puff to the forepaw. Very interestingly, you see that the insular cortex is activated by these multiple modalities in a differential manner across age. So in normal wild-type mice, the C57 black 6 strain, we see a massive activation of the auditory cortex at all ages, and just anterior to it, to the right of that large spot, the insular cortex, but primarily early in life, around postnatally 16, and this signal in this particular example gets pruned away dramatically into adulthood. In parallel with this loss of auditory input, there is a super additive effect of stimulating sound and touch together. And that's represented in the bar graph in black on the right. In a mouse strain, which uh, is considered a model of idiopathic autism, the BTBR mouse line, this pruning fails to occur. And you see a very robust auditory activation of the insular cortex into adult ages. As a consequence, we see no super additive effects of playing a sound and touch together. This pruning effect is restricted to the auditory domain and is very dramatic and rapid in wild type mice and less evident in these BTBR animals. The response to a tactile stimulus, however, is no different across ages in these two mouse strains. If you look at the anatomy of this part of the brain, you find that inhibitory circuits in the BTBR line, uh, represented by the GAD65 uh, labeling or parvalbumin labeling, um, are compromised even into adulthood. Patching on to target neurons in these areas shows a reduced frequency of inhibitory synaptic events, and these can be rescued by benzodiazepines. And so the width of these inhibitory events becomes broader and more potent in the presence of benzodiazepines in an in vitro slice preparation. And in vivo, the uh, graph in panel D in red shows that the sub-additive multisensory response becomes super-additive within a few minutes of enhancing inhibition. This then washes out. Interestingly, the super-additive effects in the wild-type strain are compromised by adding further inhibition like benzodiazepines. So we then mapped, is there a critical period for this pruning to occur? We applied benzodiazepines to the intact animal for a two week period, either early in life when auditory maps are normally pruning in this part of the brain, or in adulthood later in life when these critical periods might have passed. As you can see from the example, the auditory response in the insular cortex is quite robust in the vehicle-treated BTBR animals, but pruned away in the early diazepam-treated mice. 
This effect is seen only when the treatment is given early, and it rescues this multisensory integration in the BTBR animal, but not when the treatment is done in adulthood. The shrinkage or pruning of the IAF, insular auditory field size, is also similarly rescued by early treatment, but not late. So how does this early treatment outlast the drug treatment? Well, it seems the enhancement of inhibition at this key moment early in life promotes the further maturation of these circuits even when the drug is gone, and you see a rescue in the signal for GAD65 or another marker of these mature parvalbumin cells, WFA, which we'll talk more about in a minute. In case you wonder whether this is peculiar to the BTBR strain, we've also looked at monogenic mouse models which show autistic features, such as GABA-compromised animals or genes that have been associated to autism like Shank3. All of these animals suffer the same excitatory inhibitory imbalance and show an impairment of multisensory integration. As I've just shown you, enhancing inhibition early in life can rescue this situation, but it's possible to go too far, as in the case of a wild-type animal treated with benzodiazepine drugs, or other forms of uh, autism through the lack of a monogenic um, uh, manipulation of the MECP2 gene, the Rett syndrome mouse model. And so um, this multisensory integration, a higher order of brain function, also seems to observe the same kinds of maturational rules that an early excitatory inhibitory balance is important for the further development of these circuits. We're going to switch gears now to the closure of critical periods. If the excitatory inhibitory balance is what determines the onset, it was interesting to notice that the closure of these windows followed after some finite period. The typical interpretation is that as we mature, the brain loses a variety of plasticity factors, which may in fact be the case. However, we also might consider that the brain wants to become more stable with age and would produce molecules which would actively counteract the wiring or rewiring in response to experience. In fact, our transcriptomic studies of the visual cortex before, during, and after this critical period has identified such break-like factors which are made and um, placed uh, in the visual cortex to limit plasticity. In fact, one of the uh, nicest examples is a structure which enwraps or um, uh, engulfs these parvalbumin-positive basket cells themselves. These structures are called the perineuronal net and have been identified for over a century as a reticulated structure in the extracellular matrix which forms a very tight glove-like or saran wrapping around the cell body and proximal neurites of these cells as they mature. In pioneering work, Tommaso Pizzurusso and James Fawcett showed that if you disrupt these nets by infusing a proteolytic factor like chondroitinase, you can in fact reopen a window of plasticity in adult rodents. And now, by hindsight, we can consider this as a sort of rejuvenation of these large basket cells. So what do these nets do? Here's an artist's rendering of a perineuronal net perforated by synaptic inputs onto the cell body. And on the right is a modern super-resolution imaging of these kinds of nets using a label called WFA. This green cell is actually labeled from the outside. It's the extracellular matrix, and those holes will be filled by synapses. And so a popular idea is that this maturing, ever-tightening net is acting to stabilize synaptic contacts onto this cell. A second possible function of these nets might be as a molecular signaling device. So if you look inside these nets, you find that they're composed of a variety of molecules meshed together in a latticework and uh, overwhelmingly contain these purple wavy molecules known as chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans, sugar-bearing proteins. And this is interesting because a number of molecules may bind or stick to these sugars, and these parvalbumin-positive basket cells are very well known to be dependent on non-cell autonomous factors like 
neurotrophins, BDNF, or homeoproteins, OTX2, norregulin, or pentraxin, which they themselves don't make. And so an attractive idea is that these nets might, in fact, attract or trap these kinds of molecules to maintain a mature, fast-spiking phenotype. One example is our study in collaboration with Alain Prochance at the Collège de France in the role of OTX2. This is a homeodomain containing transcription factor, which is not produced in the mature brain, but seems to come from elsewhere and finds their way to these paralalbumin positive cells. Sure enough, in the OTX2 sequence, there is a classic sugar binding motif known as the RK doublet, arginine lysine doublet, which um, is a small peptide motif which can interact with these sugar molecules. If we were to infuse a small RK motif peptide into the mature nervous system or mature visual cortex, we can effectively outcompete the OTX2 endogenously and deplete these fast spiking cells of their OTX2 content. What this does is to reset the fast spiking firing properties of these neurons to a less mature state and in fact reduces the number of excitatory synaptic inputs to these cells, leaving behind only the largest events. Under such conditions where OTX2 in the adult brain has been depleted, we see a reopening of visual plasticity. So as shown in these examples, in greater than 90-day-old animals, a short-term monocular deprivation typically has no effect on visual acuity, but if they've been depleted of OTX2, they are now plastic. And more importantly, from a therapeutic point of view, this treatment allows the recovery of visual acuity after an initial amblyopic experience earlier in life during the normal critical period. These results suggest that an understanding of how the critical periods close might allow a reverse engineering or reopening of brain plasticity. Now this might sound like science fiction and does come with a fair dose of warning because a third important function of these perineuronal nets may be neuroprotective. In fact, in collaboration with Kim Do's laboratory at the University of Lausanne, we were able to show that a disruption of oxidative um, uh, regulation in these parvalbumin positive neurons will impact these perineuronal nets and conversely the perineuronal nets protect these cells from oxidative damage. The strategy we took was to reduce the synthesis of the primary antioxidant within neurons by disrupting either the modulatory or catalytic subunit of glutathione synthase, GCL. First, we showed that in GCLM, or modulatory subunit deficient animals, applying a stressor like GBR will in fact produce oxidative damage as labeled by 8-OxoDG in these fast spiking neurons. And the damage is inversely related to the amount of protection or coverage by perineuronal nets labeled in WFA. So the two cells showing less perineuronal net are more severely affected by the stressor. If we delete in a conditional manner GCLC only from the parvalbumin cells, we find that they develop a signature of oxidative stress. And in fact, this causes them to lose their perineuronal nets. And based on what I've told you in the first half of my talk, it should be no surprise to you, these animals interestingly have an extended critical period. So transiently anyway, the oxidative damage is good for plasticity because it keeps this break-like factor, the perineuronal net, off. We can't imagine, however, that this is a good thing for a long period of time. In fact, oxidative damage is a risk factor for schizophrenia and a number of other mental illnesses. And it might be because it transiently prolongs the period of plasticity, creating a period of instability in the brain. In fact, our colleague Sabina Barretta at McLean Hospital has mapped perineuronal nets in the human postmortem brain and found that compared to neurotypical controls, the prefrontal cortex shows a normal development of perineuronal nets as we age well into our 20s, consistent with the late critical period of this part of our brain. But in postmortem tissue from schizophrenic subjects, 
she finds that these perineuronal nets are compromised, consistent with the oxidative stress uh, load that these people are carrying. And this is consistent with well-documented um, constellation of changes in the postmortem prefrontal cortex of schizophrenic subjects, as summarized here in a review by Tom Insel. They have reduced perisomatic inhibitory circuits. They have deficient myelination, as I just showed you, deficient perineuronal nets, two of the classic brake-like structures, and excessive excitatory pruning in terms of spine number. And all of this together, viewed through a neurodevelopmental lens, looks like a brain whose critical period has not fully closed, excessively pruning circuitry. So the dream, perhaps, is captured by this uh, quote from Baudelaire, that perhaps to harness genius and creativity, we would like to be able to recover our childlike brain more at will, not in a pathological condition. And so I'll leave you with an example that suggests this still might be possible. And that is the discovery of another break-like factor which acts on the neuromodulatory systems in the brain. In fact, when you're paying attention or highly aroused, neurochemistry in your brain changes such that systems like the acetylcholine system, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, are showering the cortical mantle. These chemicals have the effect of enhancing the signal to noise, much like the initial development of inhibitory circuits during the onset of the critical period. In our screen for factors which come up with age, we identified a molecule which curiously um, uh, appears as the critical period closes. This molecule is called Lynx-1 and has been studied for over 10 years by the lab of Nat Heinz and Julie Miwa that has a structure very similar to alpha bungarotoxin. As many of you might know, alpha bungarotoxin is the active component of snake venom, which um, dampens or blocks nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in muscle. It turns out that in our brains, we carry this prototoxin, whose function, in fact, is to dampen or promote the desensitization of neuronal nicotinic receptors. Since it emerged with development, we felt it would be a classic brake light molecule whose function was to dampen transmission of some kind. In fact, if we do a monocular deprivation in these animals, we find that their visual acuity drops normally during the critical period, but they might show plasticity into adult ages. Here, summarized again, is the critical period effect in wild-type mice. A long-term monocular deprivation spanning the critical period leads to a visual acuity loss, which does not recover by simply reopening the eye, hence the critical period. In the Lynx-1 knockout mice, we see that they show a nice plasticity, but simply reopening the eye leads to a full recovery of vision. And this makes Lynx-1 an interesting druggable target, since it's a membrane-bound molecule which emerges with age and could, in fact, allow us to um, reopen plasticity. We took a strategy then to overcome this uh, break by enhancing acetylcholine pharmacologically, even in wild-type mice. This is a strategy of blocking the breakdown of acetylcholine. Acetylcholinesterase inhibitors might, in fact, allow enough acetylcholine to uh, keep these receptors going just enough to promote plasticity. And in fact, we find that a wild-type mouse can now recover visual acuity simply by reopening the eye if it's done in the presence of a cholinesterase inhibitor. This strategy is also a convenient one for translational research. Cholinesterase inhibitors have been approved for clinical use in a number of conditions, most notably Alzheimer's disease. If we could repurpose such a drug and apply it to people, young adults, for example, who have not recovered from amblyopia early in life, we might be able to restore visual acuity. We've been fortunate at Boston Children's Hospital to implement a pilot study with the help of David Hunter and found um, uh, an interesting uh, positive trend in this direction, but this is an ongoing study and uh, will require more subjects to be conclusive. Giving a cholinesterase inhibitor like donepazil to amblyopic subjects older than the age of 10 might in fact 
help with recovery by enhancing their brain plasticity. Similar strategies are undertaken in Europe using selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And perhaps the most um, uh, interesting extension of this kind of work is not to use drugs at all. Our colleagues out at UC Berkeley, Dennis Levi, or in Toronto, Daphne Maurer, have been using action video games as a way to tap into the attention-grabbing uh, benefits of these games. Sadly, the games are violent games, but they can be modified to pair first-person shooting or depth perception invoking cues in uh, tandem with this attention-grabbing scenario. They've already started to find that amblyopic subjects playing such video games can show improvements in visual acuity, perhaps because these games provide the perfect storm in the brain to override some of these breaks on plasticity and um, paired with an appropriate stimulus for training that function. So let me conclude. I've told you a lot about um, neural circuits and how they change with experience. There's no doubt that the core process in this uh, phenomenon is the maturation and pruning of synapses onto excitatory neurons. But when this process occurs can be determined by local inhibitory circuits. You might be able nowadays to go in and manipulate um, the spines or their maturational state directly. But a very promising avenue has been to disrupt or perturb the excitatory inhibitory balance. For example, you can play with the level of these maturational factors. You might be able to enrich their environment to engage these um, arousal factors. And interestingly, the receptors for these uh, neurochemicals live on inhibitory neurons, which form inhibitory connections onto these parvalbumin cells. A more invasive approach is to transplant the precursors of these inhibitory cells, but it seems unlikely this would become a therapeutic approach in the near future. And finally, you could lift the brakes. If there were some way to identify and then remove these molecular brakes, it might reset these cells to a juvenile state, allowing for the critical period to reopen. And so this has been taken perhaps uh, into the clinic by a variety of approaches such as the video game training, cholinesterase inhibitors, or transcranial magnetic stimulation, a variety of conditions which need to be better understood in terms of this excitatory inhibitory balance. Our work and that of others has shown that the critical periods in the brain are biologically determined and that this sponge-like ability to absorb experiences become stabilized for very good reason. It's a good reason not to tamper with them and destabilize your adult brain, but it could be useful under conditions of brain injury or recovery from mistimed or altered development. I'd like to end by acknowledging the folks who uh, provided the data in this talk. Uh, the people in my laboratory are shown here, and many of them have gone on to uh, lead their own laboratories around the world. I'd also like to mention our collaborators in Europe, uh, Alain Prochance, who's been a key player in the OTX2 story, Janet Worker, who has been uh, instrumental in translating our findings to humans, and David Hunter as well, and Kim Do and Michel Quino in Lausanne, who have been um, collaborating with us on the oxidative stress story. I thank all the funding uh, agencies over the years, both from Japan and the United States and Canada, who have supported this research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hens, for that informative presentation. It's time for the Q&A, and if you have questions you'd like to ask our speaker, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen and click on the send button and we'll answer as many as your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, daily rhythms 
in physiology and behavior have been linked to microRNAs to clock genes in animals. In mammals, does that suggest that microRNAs are important to differences in behavior that develop during different critical periods in different species of mammals? Thank you for the question. In fact, uh, microRNAs are a very potent way to control um, cell fate and cell function. And um, it's not yet published, but we have been working very intensively on the microRNA profile of these parvalbumin positive basket cells. And in fact, have now very striking evidence that microRNAs might be controlling a break-like factor, which appears before the critical period, and this might, in fact, allow the timing to happen when it does. And so um, clock genes uh, and the microRNAs that they might be involved with might, in fact, um, make this story even richer. But uh, your question is very well motivated. And in fact, uh, we are finding evidence for microRNAs um, now that we know which cell types to look for. The next question. Could circuit maturation and plasticity be linked to transgenerational epigenetic inheritance of eye regression in the nutrient poor conditions of blind cavefish? Well, that's a very specific question. Um, we don't work on fish, uh, but there is a, a lot of interesting meat in your question. So, in fact, epigenetic changes are probably contributing to the timing of these critical periods. In a study that um, I might be able to mention in the next slide, if you can see that, um, we tested whether epigenetic programs are involved in the closure of these critical periods in mice initially, and found that you can, in fact, reopen the gene programs necessary for uh, the visual critical period, as well as auditory critical periods, by uh, blocking um, HDAX, histone deacetylases. Again, we were fortunate that such drugs are already FDA approved for use in humans. And with the help of Janet Worker and Ellen Young, we were able to study um, critical period timing in humans trained on a variety of uh, tasks which would normally only be acquired in childhood and found that uh, disrupting HDAX in healthy adult individuals could, in fact, help them to acquire absolute pitch or perfect pitch, the ability to name a tone without the benefit of a reference note. This is something which has become very popular uh, in interest, as you can see here, um, and suggests that uh, you might be able to do what I've talked about in animals, in humans, um, but I should make a few cautionary notes that uh, this kind of epigenetic dabbling um, should not be undertaken lightly and um, might have a number of side effects that you might want to be um, wary of. Nutrition, also mentioned in your question, has interesting consequences on this excitatory inhibitory circuit balance as well. And so caloric restriction has been used in rodents to reopen a critical period. And whether or not any of this uh, is related to blind cavefish is unknown to me, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if their brains are organized uh, in similar manner, then uh, they should be sensitive to these sorts of epigenetic manipulation. Are the transplanted B PV cells not affected by the organism's immune system is a rejection to these cells. Well, the transplants are uh, directly into the visual cortex, and um, this is the work of uh, Arturo Alvarez Buya, an expert in these techniques, and Sunil Gandhi now in his own lab. Um, the brain uh, is an immune privileged site. Um, we don't uh, see evidence in their published work of this sort of rejection, but I can tell you that it's a very tricky surgery and that um, getting it to work in older and older postnatal animals 
was quite a challenge. Um, these cells have to survive in uh, a foreign environment, um, but uh, the transplant does work and it does seem to be integrated well into the visual cortex. The next question, is excessive pruning responsible for the lower neuronal count in schizophrenic? Yes, the thinning of the cortex in schizophrenic subjects is a well-known hallmark of the disease. And um, it's highly likely that uh, the excessive pruning contributes to this thinning of the cortex. Another feature is myelination is compromised, and so that might also lead to or contribute to the thinning. The next question, can LYNX-1 be synthesized? Yes, I, I would see, uh, I don't see why not. Um, the production of LYNX-1 would serve to uh, break or limit plasticity. Um, at, at this point, we're interested in uh, drugs which might block or weaken LYNX-1 function to reopen plasticity when needed. Do clock genes affect LTP through plasticity during sleep? Well, there are two questions, two questions in that question. Um, do clock genes affect LTP? Um, I don't believe this, this has been studied, certainly not in the visual cortex uh, preparation that I've been telling you about. Um, and do clock genes affect Sleep, well, of course, um, the clock genes are um, providing the circadian rhythmicity. Um, if your question is actually whether sleep affects plasticity, that's a very big field of great interest to us. And there is uh, quite interesting evidence that even in our visual plasticity paradigm, uh, sleep is quite important for consolidating the changes that are initiated by an initial uh, deprivation experience. And so whether or not uh, the clock gene is involved in that process in that way is not yet uh, addressed, but is high on our list of uh, likely um, mechanisms. Can stem cell intervention, interventions using CRISPR or Cas9 technologies affect critical periods? The CRISPR-Cas9 technology, of course, is a very exciting one. If we could um, alter the maturational state of parvalbumin cells, we should be able to reintroduce a critical period. Um, if we could produce in large number uh, parvalbumin cells rather than transplanting them out of an embryonic um, tissue source, then we might have a way to treat or reopen critical periods. So I would say, yes, I think this is an exciting avenue um, which provides an interesting paradigm for trying to understand how inhibition turns on plasticity in the first place by uh, manipulating them very specifically. Are PNNs a type of glial cell or is it simply a structural molecule and if so, what is it composed of and where is it created? So perineuronal nets, I showed a cartoon of its structure. Let's see if I can get there quickly. Um, is not a cell. The perineuronal net is the extracellular matrix surrounding these fast spiking parvalbumin cells. And so all of these molecules here uh, have names down below. 
And basically, um, they're components which are produced by glial cells, in fact, and some components produced by the parvalbumin cell, we suspect. So the link protein, this little orange dot, which may be produced by the parvalbumin cell, perhaps forms a scaffolding onto which these chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans, agrican, versican, neurocan, brevican, and so on, are uh, sticking onto, as well as cell adhesion molecules like tenase and R. And so this is uh, not a cell, but is um, the space between cells, which is filled by these particular molecules. So we are about out of time, so this will have to be our last question. What are the critical periods post-stroke? <clears throat> critical periods post-stroke. Well, this is a very interesting question with obvious uh, therapeutic implications. We know from the stroke literature in animal models in particular that the brain seems to undergo a rejuvenation, meaning that the excitatory inhibitory balance does shift transiently in favor of excitation. And this may be the brain's own way of trying to recover from the event and produce a transient plastic uh, window. But we also know that there are certain GABA transporters which change, um, which might be homeostatically trying to counteract these kinds of abrupt changes in excitatory inhibitory balance. And so um, one a possible extension of this critical period work is to extend or expand upon this mini critical period which is naturally created by the brain by um, uh, playing with the balance of um, triggering and break-like factors, which I've mentioned to you today. And uh, this is very much ongoing work in animal models of stroke uh, to try and extend the naturally emerging critical period and um, allowing for a window of therapy. Thank you once again, Dr. Hench. And I would like, also like to thank our sponsor, Indoor Technology, for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing up until September 2016. You will receive an email from Labroots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now, and thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>